All right, if you open in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 14, Hosea chapter 14 is where I'll be this evening, Hosea chapter 14, and I'll begin reading in verse 1, and the, uh, the Bible says in Hosea 14 verse 1, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously. So we will render the cas of our lips. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely. For mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast out forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell shall be as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as, as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree, from me is thy fruit found. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Let us pray here this evening. Our Father in heaven, I just pray that God, you'll help me to be clear in this message, help me to be concise, and God, I pray above all things that the name of Christ would be lifted and glorified, and uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You know, fortunately, you know, the story here of Hosea chapter number 14 is, is a sad one. You know, uh, recently I heard uh, preachers uh, make the statement saying you can't plan for a revival. In this country, and I, I believe that that's true. But I do believe we can prepare for revival. Amen. We don't know when the Spirit of God is going gonna, is gonna to turn and work, and, uh, but I believe it is our job as God's children to have our spirits ready Amen. for at any time. We have a revival meeting coming next week. And uh, as John Mark was saying about praying tomorrow, and I believe that's good, pray for the teens in their final day, uh, many of them will make uh, some very probably life-changing decisions tomorrow. All that preparation has been taking place all this week to prepare them for that final day. But I believe that we have, what, four or five days mm -hmm. to prepare mm -hmm. to be ready. That when Dr. Hamlin comes in, that we're not expecting him to bring the spirit of revival with him, because surely he will. If you've ever heard Dr. Hamlin preach, he's going to bring spirit of revival. He's going to be all over the place, and he's going to pet the cat and turn it around and all those things. But we as God's people can be ready right. in our spirit. Now back to the story of Hosea. Like I said, it's a sad one. Hosea, or God speaks to Hosea, tells him to take a wife who, whose earlier life had been unchastened and immoral. And from this marriage resulted three children of whom are given some names that are significant. And they are as follows. The firstborn, and I'll spare you from me trying to say their names. God will scatter. Not an object of favor. And lastly, once my people, but not so now. See, here is the history of God's people. In spite of all the love, the tender love that God gives to his people, uh, it's amazing to wonder how they will wander from the path of God onto the path of sin. Yeah. In this uh, time here in the nation of Israel, they are led into idolatry. They are worshiping false idols, believing false ideologies. And what a shame that the nation of God's people have become. Do they not remember what God has done for them? Do they not remember what God has delivered them from? Do they not remember the miraculous deliverance? Do they not know that the only thing that makes them good or makes them great is God? Yeah. Now, before we get too critical of the nation of Israel, I'm going to make some similarities tonight from the nation of Israel to the nation of the United States of America. You know... Is Israel was a, at this time a nation outwardly enjoying a time of prosperity and growth. Everything was going well for them financially. But however, inwardly, moral corruption and spiritual adultery was permeating the people. The same could be said of our country. 
Now, I know many would say, well, you know, Brother Stry, right now with gas prices the way they are and the price of bacon, and I understand that the price for the July 4th barbecue went up $17 or something like that. I, I'm not really sure that if America right now is prosperous. But I will say this, that our country, compared to all other countries out there, we live in great prosperity. Uh, we are blessed beyond measure. Uh, if you've ever been outside the United States of America, you would know that. We've been blessed. But we've paid a price as well. Because uh, in our blessing and what God has given to us, we study the history of our country, uh, the correct history and understanding the miracle that God did in raising up this country and, and putting uh, the type of character into the forefathers of our country to have a godly nation that we've had. And we have been prosperous. But oh, what, would we, what have we done with it? Well, we've done just like Israel. We've experienced wealth and growth, but we at the same time have sown moral corruption and spiritual idolatry. You know, we can no longer afford to ignore the sins of our people, and we can no longer to afford the sins within ourselves. Israel needed to apologize to God. And I'm going to go somewhere with that here in just a moment. See, I believe that our country, maybe even ourselves, we need to apologize uh, to God for having a lackadaisical attitude to spiritual things in this country. See, apo apologizing isn't easy. Uh, saying I'm sorry and I was wrong is often humiliating. Think about a time that you had to apologize. How hard was it? And then when you did it, or maybe you were the, someone who had someone apologize to you, what made that apology to seem sincere? Or what made that apology bad? What makes it acceptable and believable? Now, apologizing is a lot like what this chapter talks about in repentance. Actually, if you read through the whole book of Hosea, you will see that God is calling to them to repent of the way in which they had been living. Now, apologizing, like I said, is a lot like repentance, and we realize that we've been going the wrong way and need to turn around. Uh, repentance is much deeper because it's, it's between you and God. And I believe that's what's going on in our country right now. I, I believe that's why right now in our country there are so many immoral things. And not only that, but can I say that there are churches and people of God that are defending the immoral things that's going on in our country. There are churches holding crusades and holding services. I told my Sunday school class about this. This past weekend, a church in Alabama had a full service that basically was to have all the... Uh, uh, I'm just going to say homosexual lifestyle come in and they did a service where they apologized to them for the stance at which they had took. Now the stance that they had took prior to that was what is according to the word of God. Now I know that can make some people to get a little uneasy when we hit right on the hammer or the nail on the head when we get to talking about things. But in this country we have allowed moral corruption to change our people, to change our culture. And we don't do anything about it. We've allowed, uh, you know, that type of lifestyle and living to be advocated as if it's just an alternate lifestyle instead of calling what it is what it is. We, many years ago, have stopped advocating for the sale or unsales of alcohol and liquor. We've watched it destroy our families. We've watched it destroy the fabrics of our homes. And we don't do anything about it. In fact, Christians will argue why they can't drink. Amen. Yeah. Come on. Now, I would love to ha have an honest, sincere answer. Why, why can't you drink? Well, read the Word of God and you tell me why you can't drink. There's nothing good about liquor. Right. There's nothing good about liquor when a father doesn't come home to his wife. And he's down at the local tavern spending all of their grocery money. And the family cannot eat because he has spent all of his money down at the tavern. There's nothing funny about alcohol when people ingest that thing and they end up going home with someone other than their spouse only under the guise of alcohol and then come the next day and said they didn't understand or know what they were doing. Alcohol is not good. In this country, our churches, we, we don't take a, I, I believe, we don't take a strong enough stand. We're normalizing things. We normalize it. It's over into our entertainment. Uh, you, you know, sit down and, and watch some of the shows that they are showing to your children. And what are they teaching them? Immoral. 
teaching that make it a mockery of the house of God and the things of God. It's not funny. And if you dare to say something to the people of God, you know what happens? People get upset. You can't touch my entertainment. You can't touch uh, my sports that will mo openly mock your God. You can't touch that. Uh, you can't touch, uh, sorry, Walt Disney. Walt Disney has gotten so immoral, it's not the Disney of old. But don't tell a Christian that. They don't want to hear it because you're messing with my fun. You're messing with my entertainment. See, you can't get Christians to wake up and look about and see what's happening uh, to our country. I think God needs an apology. I think God needs an apology from the uh, citizens of this great country and what God's done with this country and what has raised it up and what we've become today that we have all the, and now we're starting to reap some of the uh, things in our society that's happened. Why has that happened? I'll tell you why uh, shooting and everything is so normal. It's normalized. We're desensitized. Children grow up watching these graphic, horrific shows that show the worst violence that you can think of, and they think it's normal. They don't think anything's wrong with it. They think it's cool. These movies that are showing things, and I don't know, I grew up in a generation where parents would not let you watch those things. You had to get parental approval to watch it. Uh, but we've lost that. And it's worse, folks, not just violence. See, they're desensitized. They think nothing of life, but why would they? Uh, we've been butchering babies for how many years now? We, we, don't, even, we don't even talk about it. Yeah. We, we want to call it another name, and we want side, you know, to uh, sidestep it and not address it head on. I think God deserves a, an apology from this country. Mm. Man, we have been blessed, so blessed. No country has stood in freedom like we have stood. And what we once stood for and what we stand for now is horrific. We need to wake up. Amen. And that's what God is saying here to the nation of Israel. Now, I want us to think about the motivation to repent. Why would anybody, uh, why should anybody repent? Well, let's look at God's point of view. Why does he want us uh, to repent? It's because he made us, he knows us, and he loves us. Think about the people of Hosea here that he's preaching to. You know, was God angry with them, upset with them? Yes. Was God hurt by their waywardness? Yes. Was God threatening punishment? Yes. And you may say, well, why didn't God just get rid of them? Well, because that's not the way love works. See, God is love, and love is patient. God doesn't want any to perish. We know the verse so well, 2 Peter 3.19. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So what's the motivation from man's point of view? If a person repents or turns from the ways in which he's been going and returns to God, will it solve all of his problems? Will it relieve all of his pains? The answer to that is no. God, uh, uh, getting your heart right with God will not immediately fix uh, your spouse or your marriages, will not immediately fix your children, it will not immediately fix your boss at work, will not immediately fix your financial problems or your health problems, the economy or the government. Getting right with God will not leave, relieve the pain of living in a fallen world. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Repentance fixes what can be fixed, and that is our hearts. In the world, we still have problems and pain. We'll still suffer the consequences of a sinful world. However, our hearts will be changed so that we have the strength to trust God to do His will. We'll be able to truly say or tr truly do all that God would ask of us despite the problems and pains of life. See, the book of Hosea is a message about impending doom and destruction on the northern kingdom because of the spiritually waywardness that had come into the nation. God's judgment was coming. Why was it coming? Well, the people were worshiping Baal, a false god. And uh, in this country, we, you know, we could give them credit because at least they had one or just a few false gods. But in this country, we have many false gods. Uh, people, you know, uh, you think about it, it's so heartbreaking and uh, for young people, thinking about those teenagers. But around this country, we lift up athletes and celebrities up higher than the man of God. Mm -hmm. And then we stand and look amazed as why when a teenager goes into a very difficult part or time in their life, and you say, preacher, can you help my young person? Can I talk to them? And there's no help for them. And you'll say, well, it must be a bad preacher. It's not a bad preacher. But see, when you allow the athletes and celebrities to have such a place in your young person's right. life, right. it makes the counsel of God almost null and void. That's right. 
They're not going to listen. They're, they're going to be affected by celebrities. They're going to be affected by, you know, these athletes that come out. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I know the athletes get upset by these, these statements. I don't care what they think. I just want them to play ball. When I watch a game, I'm, I'm not looking for your statement. I just want to watch you play ball. That's it. But we've got to be careful uh, to, ma to make sure that we don't, you know, and, and I'm sorry, but these celebrities and these athletes, they're like gods. Yeah. Young people look at them like gods. Yeah. They don't want to just wear their shoes and wear their shirts. They want to, they, they know everything about them. And every saying that they've ever said, they, they, they don't just take the quote and wear it on their T-shirt. They take their quote and they put it in here. Mm -hmm. They listen to them. Yeah. See, the priests had stopped teaching God's law. The society in general, as a result of that, had experienced a complete moral breakdown. The nation had turned their back on God by making alliances with their enemies. And I believe in our country, as I said, uh, the church, I, I think we have made some alliances with some things that we shouldn't make alliances with. God's word is still true and man is still a liar. That, you know, it's not what I think about a certain topic. It's not even what you think about a certain topic. It's what God thinks about a certain topic. And God was so generous and kind to give us his word that we can read it. Now, you say, well, but I found a version that doesn't have that. Well, I wonder why. Because they wanted to eliminate it, so they created I mean, come on, folks. We know why those false versions exist. They want to do away with things. That's a perversion of the word of God. So, uh, you, know, the, you know, making alliances with, with enemies of, the, uh, of God, and we shouldn't do that. We should uphold the truth. And by the way, don't let people make you think that you're unloving or uncaring because you preach the Word of God. That's not true. You couldn't love people more than people that are telling them a lie. When they get before the Lord, you understand that on Judgment Day, when Christ comes and it's over and they stand there in judgment, they're... Most of them are going to stand there with the false counsel of some ungodly person that's going to make them think that Jesus just accepts everything. That no change, no repentance had to come to that person. And that's not true. Now, the loving person would tell them and warn them and say, look, you understand you're dealing with a holy God. Do you understand what God said in His Word about that and what you're trying to do? Do you understand He doesn't want that for you? Do you understand that He wants you to have a better life? Do you understand that He wants you to stay away and abstain from all those things because God has better for you? Amen. See, despite their low spiritual condition, their unrepentant heart, it's amazing, but God, even through all... I mean, if, 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 if anything, we should praise God for His long-suffering. Not just to the nation of Israel, but to you and I. Amen. How many times has he spoke to us about something? How many times has he convicted you about something? How many times has he told you, I don't want you to do that. I want you to repent of that. I want you to change that. I want you to come to the altar and lay it and leave it here. But we don't listen. We're not obedient. Now, uh, Hosea chapter 11, you'll see several verses about his love for this nation. In verse 1, he said, When Israel was a child, then I loved him. Boy, God's love is far different than the love you and I have. This is that agape love. This is that seeking love. God sought you. He sought me. He sought every person in this room. He sought the nation of Israel. Verse 4, he said, I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love. And I was to them as they that take off the yoke of their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. In verse 8, he said, How shall I give thee up, O Ephraim? Can you hear the pleading of God's voice? Uh, when he looks at his people, and every time people are, are engaged in something that is unspiritual and unscriptural, and, he'll, and, and he looks and he begs to his people, Why are you doing that? Why do you look for your peace and comfort in the things of the world? Uh, people will, it's amazing what people would do under stress, so they say. Well, I'm going to have a drink because I'm under stress. I'm going to watch some ungodly movie because I'm under stress, and I don't need to just think about anything for a while. How about think about God? Because He sure is thinking about you, and He wants to help. See, the nation 
How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zebium? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentance are kindled together. See, what these people needed was what anybody would need if they find themselves drifting from the path of God. That is a repentant heart. You know, repentance, or the word repent simply means to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about anyone's wrongdoing or sin. You know, I've, I've taught this in my Sunday school. I think I'm sorry is, is a phrase that people just know immediately and instinctively just to throw it out there. And I think it's lost its effect because we don't s sincerely sit down and think about what we're apologizing for. See, but to, to do this, it, it is a complete change of heart. When a person changes their heart towards God, they realize that God is right along and that their thoughts and ideas about Him are wrong. You know, some of these uh, pamphlets and material I see out there nowadays, I don't know what God they're talking about. They use His name, but I, that's not the Lord I know. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know where they're getting that stuff from. I have a feeling it's from those alternate versions. See, we're, we're trying to change, change Christ into conforming to our culture instead of our culture conforming into what Christ would want it to be. Now, let's examine. I'm going to just talk real, very briefly about a few things in Hosea 14 that he says to the nation of Israel. And this idea of repentance, we know repentance just means to feel sincere, regress, or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Number one, repentance involves a permanent change of direction. In verse 1, that's what he talks about. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. See, rebellion, we understand, is turning from God to a life of sin. So therefore, the, the counter of that, or the opposite of that, would be turning from sin to God. See, the prodigal son in Luke 15, 18 gives us a good example of this when he said, after he came to the end of himself and uh, was feeding of the husk of the swine and everything, and spent all, the, all, all of his, his money, and said, I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. But you know, nowhere in Scripture does it say that he went to his father only to feel better so that he could return back to a far country. You know, sometimes folks do that. They get into a bind, they get into a mess, and they come to God, and they think they can trick God. They think they can fool Him. Well, if I come up and say a, a, a sentence or say that prayer, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're truly going to get saved in your heart, it's going to come from a heart of repentance. But they'll, they'll sit there and believing that if I just say this, magically, everything will be fixed, and then... Maybe I get some help from the church or from someone, and then the problem gets uh, resolved, and then they immediately go back on out to that far country to continue doing what they was doing. See, this man didn't want to just ease his conscience. He was convicted and wanted to get things right. This was not a temporary change to see if he could change his circumstances. This was a permanent change whether or not his circumstances changed, even if it meant being a servant because he had made a a uh, 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 statement saying that he, he would take the position of a servant, less than that of a son. And we know the father did not do that to him. Right. But that's what he was willing to do to get back in to his father's good graces. See, perhaps the clearest way you can tell the genuineness of a person's repentance is how long it lasts. Hosea chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath turned, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. And uh, after two days, he will revive us, and the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth to prepare as the morning, he shall come unto us as the rain, and the latter form of rain unto the earth. And then verse 4, he says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. You know, some people's repentance is very short-lived. You know, as, 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 as like the morning dew, it's gone by noon. See, repentance, I, I believe, needs to be done out of a sincere heart. And secondly, repentance involves a clear awareness of sin. Uh, you know, when you, you know, sometimes you, you witness to people and you talk to them, and, you know, uh, you know, sin is a little bit more than a little white line. Did you ever take a cookie out of the cookie jar? Sin is much, much greater than that. It's much more horrific than that. 
And, uh, but when it comes to that, if you look into Hosea, back to Hosea 14, 2, you'll see the Bible says uh, in verse 2, Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away all thy iniquity and receive us graciously. So, you know, take with you words. You know, God likes those words. You know what he's saying? That means say it. I want you to come to me. Sometimes, you ever, you ever had someone that they never like to apologize? They just assume because they kind of come back up and kind of... <laughs> that's their I'm sorry when they're wrong. God, God's not looking for a fist bump right. or a little shrug of the shoulder. And he does that for a reason. Yeah. See... You know, years ago when you got into trouble, this is how it used to be. I don't know if it's still the same way. But when you got into trouble and you were going to use those words, I'm sorry, with your mom and dad, it didn't stop there. You know what came next? What are you sorry for? What was it? What did you do? And most times your parents knew exactly what you did. And just like God did to Adam and Eve in the garden, they want you to tell because they want to see if you actually know what you did and if you're truly sorry, if you really mean it. And isn't it amazing that when someone is truly sorry, I mean, they're broken, they're busted up, they're sobbing. You ever talk to someone who is trying to talk to you while they're sobbing? And you can hardly make out the words, but you understand what they're saying. You know, I think God needs to, to hear his people sob a little bit yeah. from, a, from a place of a broken heart. Uh, we say we care about our country, and we say we, we, we care about what's going on in our country, but are, are we only concerned about politics? But are we concerned about the faith of our country? Are we concerned about the, the direction in which his people are going? And if we're going to cry out to God, are we going to sob? Are yeah. we going to say, God, you know, I'm sorry, you know, our country, hmm or that brokenness that comes. So you take with you words and use them. You know, plus your parents, you know, also used to make, if you were going to tell somebody you were sorry, you had to speak to them face to face. And uh, they had to be able to understand you. You had to make it audible. You know, so, you know I, I think that's good. See, repentance is more than a, just a general commitment to change. You have to have a clear idea of what you are repenting of. You know, that prayer that David prays, you know, we, a lot of people, we use that, and I hear it all the time. Search me, O God, and see if there be. But do you mean that? Because if God shows it to you, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to ignore it? Walk away from it? Or are you going to surrender to God and say, God, it's time. It's time that I deal with this. It's time that... I get this right with you. See, in Luke 15, he said, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven, or against heaven and against you. Can I ask you this? When you got saved and you repented, did the Father hear you when you repented? Have you repented? I mean, I would hope that the motivation we said that prayer wasn't to please a spouse, wasn't to please a preacher, wasn't to get help from the church. Right. My prayer would be that you said that prayer, that you understood your sin against God, and you knew exactly what you were repenting of. And did he hear you? And have you done it? But can I ask you this? Has he heard from you since? Mm, that's good. I mean, repentance is not just a one-time thing. Right. Uh, repentance should really be a daily occurrence. Right. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have enough... Uh, inventory by the end of the day that uh, I need to meet with God and unload that inventory. Right. See, re repentance involves a desire, desire to know God better. And the only way we're ever going to know God better is by going through these processes. See, he says in, uh, to, to, uh, to receive us graciously, and so we'll re re render the calves of our lips, that we may offer you the fruit of our lips, too often the motivation to repent is sustained by the hope that circumstances will change and God will do something about whatever it is that uh, brought you to that point and that the painful feelings would go away. But in this chapter, 
when Hosea is saying this, when it is being recorded here, the motivation here is to worship, to know God better, learning to praise God. And you'll never know God better and praise Him better if there's something between you. You can't. You can't. But as soon as you think about everything that God has delivered you from, and as soon as you think about who you really are, and God knows who you really are, you can't trick him, you can't fool him, you can't pull the wool over his eyes. You might be able to put on a nice suit or tie or dress and come to church and people would think good of you, but God sees every ounce of you. And by the way, he knows the full inventory all the back when you were in the womb, all the way to that point, God knows, and even beyond that, God knows you. He knows you, and yet He still loves you. Now, do we understand that to know God better, you know, that's why some people, I know some people get nervous when folks will shout, people get excited. I'm going to tell you, I've been in a couple meetings that would really make you nervous. And you know why those services get like that? Because I don't know what it is when you start to think about what God's done for you. Yeah. I mean, are you appreciative of it? it do you understand that, that hell is real? Hell is hot. And that's exactly where you and I were heading until a loving Savior who loved us even while we were yet in our sins, in our filth. He didn't wait for us to clean up, but God loved you and came to you and spared you from that judgment to come, and it would have been a righteous judgment. That's why people, when they think of it, they get overwhelmed in emotions, and they can't contain it. That's why they'll raise their hands. I've seen people that will openly sob and begin to cry, and people be wondering what is going on with them. I'll tell you what's going on with them. What's going on with them is they're remembering everything God has done for them, and despite of them, God has still loved them. Amen. And that is what is overtaking them. Amen. That's how we get close to God. But you know what happens? The reason you get hindered from reaching that point in your worship is you have something that's in the way. Right. Something that you've got to get cleared up. Something that you've got to confess to God. You've got to make it right with Him to know that kind of fellowship. Have you ever thought about the day when He returns to this world? Are you just going to stare and say, oh, yay? I told you, or I tell my son, I'm a very visual person. I like to use my imagination. I didn't have Xbox, PlayStation, all that fancy stuff. When we were kids, you had to create your own fun. You had to go out back and you could, it's amazing, you could put on a pair of work boots and instantly transform into John Wayne. You could cut up a stick off a branch, and that thing could be just about anything. It could be a rifle. It could be a Roman sword. It could be anything. It could be a horse. But you know, I like that kind of imagination when I think about he's coming. Amen. I wonder what it's going to be like. I wonder what it's going to be like to hear that sound and to look up and know it's happening. Now, for some, it's a joyous occasion. For others, it isn't. For others, it's a mark of the end. It's over. It's over. The ones that want to keep playing with salvation and playing with God and don't want to get serious or sincere about this thing, well, I hope they're not one of the ones that perish in the awful destruction that comes with that. And I hope they get it. But see, even now, tonight, and every week, God will extend his hand. A preacher gives a, 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 a altar call at the end of every service. He puts forth the hand. That's God's hand, you know, that, that is coming and, and reaching out to you. How many times does God have to, to tell you to get saved? How many times does God have to tell you that you need to repent, get that right? You've got to get that right. You know, when it comes to this description here in Hosea, you know, the thing is, uh, when we come to God, we realize that it's only faith in our Lord Jesus Christ that will save us. It's not in anything of this world. It's, it's, it's in Him. It's not humanity. It's in Him. See, the reality of true repentance, why it's so, you know, a lot of people avoid it, is because, as I said at the beginning, it can be quite painful. See, it's painful to drastically change directions permanently. That means God's way, not your way. 
Uh, that means you're not going to take things of the world and say, well, you know what I'll do? I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to interpret this Bible as according to what I want it to say. And, you know, I'm not going to get very serious about this thing. And I'm not going to go too far over the top with this thing. And you're going to try to mix the world and God together. It never works. Oh, it may work for you for a while, but you'll be miserable. You'll be miserable. See, it's a, it's a change, a drastically change in God's way, not the world's way. Secondly, to admit that you have sinned even after you got saved. Like I said before, some people will repent when they get saved, but that's the last God's heard from them. And, you know, they'll take advantage of his grace and use it as an excuse to do anything and to be any way. And I've even heard people over the years say, well, God knows I, I'm sorry for that. Well, no, are you sorry? That's what God wants to know. Okay. Thirdly, to realize that knowing God will not eliminate all the other problems, even though it will eliminate your biggest problem. Mm -hmm. To acknowledge that we don't have the resources to make life work, but God does. God's way is the best way. And what's God's people surrender to this? But you know what's going on in this country, and I think it's been going on for quite some time, is that people are trying to mix the world and God together. They're trying to put them together, and it doesn't work. People hate to hear that word separation. They hate to hear that word conviction. People will get upset when you start coming down the aisle preaching of certain sins, whether it's about alcohol, homosexuality, immorality, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, corrupt programs on television today that people will spend their good money, tell God they don't have the money to tithe, but they'll, you'll be sure that they'll pay for all those channels with that inappropriate program. And here's the thing. God's people will think they can't live without it. They think they can't live without it. I can't live without TV. I have to have it. Well, who told you that? Yeah, right. Who told you that? And I, people say, Brother Stroud, do you have it? Yes, I have a TV. But I'm very guarded on what I watch. Amen. I'm just very guarded. If there's a curse word, because you can't trust ratings anymore, because PG does not mean whatever that used to mean. If there's a curse, it gets cut off. I don't have like a three or four word limit. I have a one word limit. It gets cut off. Amen. Uh, if there is, you know, you know, uh, folks, can I say in, in, in most of your programming and television shows is, is, is not just violent, but offers at least soft, soft pornography. People that aren't dressed right, boys and girls both. And we as Christians, we don't think anything about it. We're, watch, we're letting our kids watch this, and we're not doing anything about it. You know, the church used to have much more power. And by the way, it still has all the power in the world because it's still God's church. But we don't use it like we used to. You know, back in the 50s, you know, I've, I've told you this before, I believe. That's why the NFL couldn't kick off till 1 o'clock. The church said no. They couldn't do it. They were trying to compete with college football. College football was too popular. They said, well, we'll play on Sunday. The church said, absolutely not. We, our men have to be in church. And the men and the women agreed with that. So they moved it to 1 o'clock and said, well, we'll let them go to church. And then when they, but, you know, when they come home from church, they can watch the game. The problem with that is we, 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 we didn't realize the danger of that. That's the problem with compromise. You let just a little bit in, now you can't get them out of it. Amen. You can't. If there's a game on Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday is the worst attended Sunday in all of America. Because of one event. And churches now will close their doors to show the game on TV. Mm. Can you imagine that? Nothing. And it gets worse. Now, quickly, I'll just give you a couple things of why this pain, why, it is in, why it's worth it. Number one, God will hear our waywardness. He said in verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger is turned away from them. There is no promise that God will fix all of our circumstances so that we'll never feel pain. But there is a promise that he will heal our heart. He doesn't uh, make us perfect, but he does change our passions so the compulsive longing to sin no longer masters us. God, Secondly, God will strengthen our faith. In verse 5, he shall grow and cast forth his roots. He will be like the dew to Israel, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. He will grow. God will strengthen and stabilize our lives. He'll give us deeper confidence in him.
Thirdly, God will make our life attractive. Verse 6, his branches shall spread, his beauty shall be as the olive tree. See, there's an attractive glow and sweet aroma uh, from people that comes from a person that's humbled himself before God. God will make our life a blessing to others. In verse 7, they that dwell under the shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. See, Hosea pictures the restoration of the penitent as the emergence of new life in a dry field in which the refreshing dew has fallen. In the early summer and autumn of, or, or in, the, in the summer and early autumn in Israel, the dew is very heavy and greatly appreciated. Isaiah 18:4. For God, for so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew that in the heat of harvest is very refreshing. You know, the vegetation will appear, beauty, uh, producing beauty and fragrance and where the farmer once saw only ugliness and emptiness, the fallow ground becomes a fruitful garden. See, healthy things grow and growing things change. Just like a garden grows and produces fruit, we understand that we should be growing in our relationship with God. But in order for the garden to produce good fruit, the soil must be prepared to receive the seed. But then after it receives the seed, uh, if you've ever tried to grow anything, you'll know you have to cultivate the soil. And with that, sometimes you have to throw some things out. See, when you cultivate soils, you'll have to break up the ground. You'll have to throw things out that would be harmful. See, in verse 1, God pleased with the people to return to him. He said, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. See, God pleads with his people to return to him and forsake their sins. We know this verse so well. It's probably, I guess, probably the most famous verse in Hosea, or a lot of people know it. In uh, Hosea 10, 12, when he said, So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. And he says, do what? Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord, and he will come and rain righteousness upon you. See, it is time to seek the Lord. Can I ask you tonight, do you have any fallow ground that needs to be broken up? Is there any hardness of your heart that you need to soften to the things of God? Is there someone who is listening here tonight that you need to turn from the world? You've been too involved in it. You've been too trusting in it. You've been too cultivating in it. You've been captivated by the world. Can I tell you it's time to break up with the world? It's time to break up your fallow ground and return to the Lord thy God. You know, as I was uh, uh, preparing this, I uh, came across that song, Nothing Between My Soul and My Savior. Listen to what the writer of this song said. Not of world's delusive dream, I have renounced all sinful pleasures. Why? Because Jesus is mine. There's nothing between me and him. Now, I add the and him, but there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Nothing between like worldly pleasure, habits of life, Though harmless they may seem, must not my heart from him ever sever. He is my all. Folks, if we really care about America the way we say we care about America, as John Mark preached the other night on Sunday night, is the one element to everything that we need. We have got to have the power of the Spirit of God. But that power will not come to a tainted vessel it will not come as long as there is something between you and the Savior. We have loved family members, many that we've been praying for years. It's time to go to the next level. And if we're going to go to the next level, we've got to have the power of God. Come next week, we'll have Dr. Hanlon here for three nights, I think a total of five services. Uh, and if we really uh, want to see something done in our county, done in our country, done in our city, done in your community, done in your family, wherever it is that you want done, do we understand? We've got to have the power of God, whatever it is. You, know, you may have to turn the television off for a while. You know, Jack Howells made this statement the, uh, I was reading the other day. He said, you know, I love sports. He said, how many games have I watched? None. Now, I know this is going to sound extreme to some, but if you know anything about Brother Howells, you would say that the power of God was on his life. The man touched, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives through his ministry. He said, I love the Dallas Cowboys. Do you know how many games of theirs I've seen? None. He said, I love to play sports, but I've played none. He said, in my mind, if I got time to play, I got time to pray. 
Now, that may sound severe, but if we want the power of God and we don't like what's going on in our country and we want to see things change, not politically, not financially, that's not our goal. If the political doesn't go our way and the financial doesn't go our way, but we need this country to start going back to God's way. That's the only hope for America that there is. Now, my prayer tonight would be that there's nothing between you and the Lord. If there is, I, I just would encourage you to, whatever it is, to come as the Lord would lead you and leave nothing between you and Him. And hey, let's beg as, as a people, as a person, individually we can do this, but we can also do this as a church. You know, we can beg and ask God for His power. God, we want the power to, to reach Frederick County. God, we, we, we have uh, th uh, three bus routes running, a fourth about to start, and God, what those bus captains need is your power to draw on those kids in every one of those neighborhoods. We can pray for every Sunday school teacher. God, we've got to have your power. When every soul winner goes out to knock on, his, on, on somebody's door, the only reason that somebody will come to know Christ is because the Holy Spirit of God is working in that interaction. God, we've got to have your power. God, when I go to my family reunion and I, my family members that I have cared and, and prayed about for the last how many ever years that I've been praying for them, God, I, I need your power to reach them. Please. We've got to have your power. So as God's people, can we beg God and ask God, let's not just have another uh, normal or ordinary revival meeting. Two years ago, he talked about it. A protracted meeting occurred. How did that occur? Because we were so sick and tired of being shut in from COVID and couldn't wait to get back under the sounds of sound preaching and couldn't wait to fellowship with one another that we got excited. We, we protracted that meeting. Wouldn't you like to see another protracted meeting? Wouldn't you like to see that, hey, we've got to keep going? Uh, because God's power is moving in this service. God's power is moving in this meeting. That's what we got to have. If we're ever going to do anything, and that'll never happen, as long as there is something between you and the Lord, I pray that there isn't. And if so, I pray that you take care of it tonight. Uh, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do love you and thank you. God, for your long suffering. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. Thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. God, you've been so good to us. And God, I just pray that as we pre prepare for this meeting, God, I know uh, folks say you can't plan for a revival meeting, but I do believe we can prepare. I, I believe we have several days, God, that we can fall on our faces before God. I don't want this meeting just to be another meeting. God, we want to see your power. God, we want to see folks walk down the aisle that we prayed uh, many years for. God, we want to see, uh, uh, we still believe that miracles can occur. God, we're, we're thankful for all the testimonies over the years that we've heard. But God, we want to see something happen. We want to see the power of God fall upon that service. We want to see the power of God uh, to, 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 to reach this community. God, we want to see the power of God to build that new building out on Horan Road. God, we want to see the power of God to, to reach untold, just name after name after name that has come to know Jesus. Jesus Christ is their Savior. Oh, God, we have to have your power. God, we need it. We're asking you for it. God, let it be that nothing be between you and us, that, God, we would fall and repent of that now. And, God, you, truly, we are sorry for the richness and greatness of this nation that you've given us. God, what a mess we've made of it. God, we haven't been faithful to you and to your word. God, we haven't uh, shunned the things that needed to be shunned. We haven't stood up strong enough against the forces of evil that seek to destroy this godly nation. God, we pray that you be in this uh, in the next few moments in time of prayer. I pray that you would bless all those that are here. Uh, for I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.